Welcome back after lunch. My name is Yong Wook Liu. I teach and research in the Department of International Relations here. Uh, as you know, lunchtime is, uh, is an interesting time when a lot of amazing things can happen. And one thing that happens this, during this lunchtime is uh, we have new chair for this session, which is me, right? Um, so I don't know whether it's an amazing and, and good happening, but, uh, but we will see how it goes. Uh, I'm not qualified um, enough to chair any session relating to Mongolia. My research is not about Mongolia. I do research about its neighbors, though, right, such as China and Japan. Um, so perhaps, um, perhaps that's, the, that's one linkage with this session um, and me. Um, but also I research on international relations and foreign policy, security policy. So that's probably the closer uh, link between me and our speaker today. Uh, the, let, me, let me not waste um, any more time because we do have a very interesting session um, uh, coming up. Professor, uh, and here I, I have to be, um, I have to uh, issue a warning. I probably cannot pronounce your name uh, totally uh, uh, accurately. Professor Munk Orcher uh, Dorchter. Uh, it's perfect, okay, close <laughs> enough, right? Um, is, a, is a current director of Defense Policy Institute at the National Defense University in Mongolia. Uh, he is an expert on Mongolian foreign affairs as well as security and strategic studies. His research interests include Mongolian history, especially the 21st century history, political and military implications of historical events, and Mongolian national security. He's been a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution in USA from 2010 and 2011. And he was a formerly an associate senior researcher at the Institute of Strategic Studies in Mongolia's National Security Council and an officer in the Mongolian army. And during the lunchtime, I had, a, um, I had an opportunity to speak with um, Professor Dorsk Der, um, and I found him very approachable and interesting person. And I might um, add, without glasses, he probably looks like the, um, the, the former Mongolian small champion in Japan, Asa Shoryu, as well. <laughs> so without further ado, let's welcome our speaker. OK, uh, thank you, Dr. Yu. That's uh, too much of a flattering. Um, it's quite a daunting, isn't it? It's after lunch, 2 o'clock p.m. Um, I always hate to speak. Uh, uh, I have speaking engagements during this period of time uh, for obvious uh, human uh, physiological reasons. People are not prone to listen to lengthy speeches at this time of uh, day. Um, it is also customary, almost a ritualistic tradition at any venues like this, uh, uh, especially international fora, for a speaker to mention three things in advance. Thanking the hosts, uh, which I will do uh, now, because not because I must, but because I'm sincere. And for obvious reasons, I will mention afterwards during my presentation. I think it's really, uh, truly an important event. Uh, ANU, in particular, the Mongolia Institute, Professor Narongoa and uh, Ambassador Bold and his dedicated team put together th um, to make this happen. And I thank you all for, um, uh, for your hard work efforts. Uh, again, not just uh, because I'm trying to be nice and polite, but for some reasons I will mention during my presentation. And second thing people usually do is to try to find similarities between uh, the host country and uh, his or her own country. And again, I, I'm not trying to mention the obvious things like, uh, thank you, sir the population density, the landscape, the, the, uh, the economic, uh, uh, the, uh, the mining uh, factor in economy, etc., etc. I'll just mention that uh, uh, our two countries undoubtedly share two very important, uh, two very significant similarities. Um, one is, of course, our, uh, thank you, uh, the values we share. Uh, earlier, uh, our distinguished panelists spoke about uh, our commitment to democracy. It's, uh, it's, a bit, uh, it's a bit rocky, it's a bit challenging, it's a bit uh, messy, but nevertheless, we are committed to uh, make our country a, a fledgling democracy. And secondly, both nations uh, envision ourselves as an Asia and Pacific player, an actor uh, positioning to be to play a, a more engaging and active role in our border region, Asia and Pacific, for uh, uh, political and uh, security reasons. 
Um, and based on that similarity and those uh, commonalities we have, I will try to uh, dwell on what I'm going to uh, talk to you. And third, um, it's almost ritualistic to say that uh, usually every speaker says, uh, this is uh, my personal opinion, my, my, my opinions do not necessarily reflect the position of the government of the, this country or that country. Um, I work for the government. I'm, I'm a military officer in the Mongolian Armed Forces, so I... Although I don't think any of my uh, findings and ideas would be strongly rejected by my authorities, I nevertheless, for the sake of uh, 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 safety net, uh, mentioned that this should not necessarily reflect the opinion of the Ministry of Defense, the Armed Forces of Mongolia, or the National Defense University of Mongolia. Okay, uh, uh, I have to discuss uh, uh, or just throw some ideas, make some, uh, cite some facts, uh, numbers and ideas, but also a few words about ensuing uh, controversies. What a speech without mentioning controversies or problems or challenges about Mongolia's national security policy in general and defense uh, reforms and Mongolian armed forces peacekeeping commitments in particular. So it's a very challenging task. We have time limit. I have to uh, um, uh, smash these broad issues together into one. Uh, otherwise, what, would, what I'm afraid would be an incoherent and illogical uh, presentation. It's, it's somewhat easier for me because uh, throughout the past 22 years of uh, Mongolia's all-rounded social, economic, and political transformation, uh, my sector, the defense and security, has been, uh, I should probably say, the most successfully transformed, uh, the least controversially transformed, reformed sectors of our public life. Um, but also, uh, uh, it should be a, a challenging because I have to lump many different ideas, different numbers in a nutshell. Uh, I also shall mention that uh, only a couple of days ago we have uh, witnessed uh, the first ever the inaugural successful visit by our child chief of defense forces to Australia uh, with his Australian counterpart and uh, I am beginning to hear uh, 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 news that uh, the visit was successful and uh, ideas were shared about enhancing our bilateral ties in the years to come. Uh, okay, I, probably sh I shall start from the national security concept uh, um, in very generic terms, what it is, because it's the guiding principle, guiding document of, uh, uh, of our national policy when it comes to national security, foreign policy, defense transformation, and, and whatnot else. Um, the current concept was adopted, promulgated by our parliament two years ago in the summer of 2010. Um, it is the second national security concept in Mongolia's history, the first being the one adopted in 1994. Although uh, it's a different document, it uh, echoes the same principles and it continues uh, to, uh, it continues to display the strategies uh, we, the, the, the nation, the government and people of Mongolia must take in order to ensure, maximally safeguard our national security. And it, uh, uh, although it's revised, it, it, has, it is stemming from the principles of uh, respect to human rights, maximum sovereignty of Mongolia, becoming an active player in, player in the international arena all these principles as enshrined in the Constitution of Mongolia of 1992. So what is basically our own perception of security? Uh, we have to look at uh, the geographical, geopolitical, and yes, demographic and cultural and historical situations of Mongolia, which is rather unique compared to many other nations. We are in a very unique neighborhood. Uh, as our president once told to an American audience, some call it, quote from the president, uh, Albert Deutsch, some call it a rough neighborhood, but in my opinion, it could be also a rather benign neighborhood, and, end of quote. What did he mean? And I can't agree anymore with that. Uh, you might think it's rough. Uh, we are sandwiched between two nuclear powers, two giant non-democracies, uh, both of whom had a, either strong influence or domineering position in Mongolia's history. But let's think it from, take a look at, at this phenomena from a uh, 
glass uh, full, uh, half full uh, approach rather than glass half empty approach. The two strong powers are effectively shielding Mongolia from a number of international perils, such as uh, terrorist threat, uh, insurgents in any part of the world, because these two are strong, these two are centralized, and these two neighbors are, uh, they want to make sure that no such international perils enter their own, uh, they want to make sure that they will put down any uh, manifestations of, of such perils should they enter their own national territories. And Mongolia being isolated by hundreds and thousands of kilometers from uh, any other third physical uh, country. Uh, that makes us relatively, a, uh, from a security practitioner point of view, a relatively safe neighborhood. And we're also in the midst of a triple bilateral strategic partnerships. What do I mean by triple bilateral strategic partnerships? We have a Mongolia-Russia strategic partnership agreement. And the strategic partnership, it's, it's one of the highest levels of uh, confidence. Um, it's not yet alliance, but it's, but, but it's good enough. Uh, we have Mongolia-China strategic partnership relations. And last but not the least, uh, Russia and China have their own uh, bilateral strategic partnership relations. We don't, we don't have any trilateral setting but we live in the midst of a triple bilateral strategic partnership relations, which uh, uh, makes us uh, to differently, uh, rather than any small nation, uh, rather than any nation of our caliber, to, see the, uh, to have the perception of our security. And we have the comprehensive notion, the comprehensive concept of what national security means, which is not only the physical existence of Mongolia as a country, Independence and sovereignty issues uh, are to our greatest advantage uh, seem to be out of uh, immediate question. We have uh, no territorial disputes or even any political disagreements on major issues with our two neighbors. So we, are, we live in, in a relatively, say, uh, advantageous time and uh, period in history with a relatively advantageous strictly speaking from the security point of view, uh, to indulge uh, what we can define uh, our security. It's basically comprehensive, it's human security. So what well, the meaning of national security is to ensure the maximum uh, quality of life and well-being to each and every Mongolian citizen. So the, the, the security concept is dictated both by the contemporary mindset, political and social economic realities. So in one hand, it's depending on the mindset, the perception of Mongolians about our own security. Also, it reflects political, social, and economic realities. So it's both idealist and realistic outlook. Um, and it says for the pure, pure existence, pure physical uh, notion of security, political and diplomatic actions should be the primary means of achieving such security. Um, I'll briefly skim through what are the six constituent parts and then probably save more time to a more concrete issue about what, have been, what we have been doing for, for the defense reform. Um, in our concept, uh, we define Mongolia's national security is composed of six constituent parts. The, one, the first one is we call security of existence. In a more recognized international relations and security studies term, it will be physical security of nation including, uh, even including the cultural and demographic notions of security, which is a, a bit controversial, but it's a, uh, I would say it's a necessary component of, of how we define it, and I'll probably leave it for the further discussion. Um, domestic, uh, which means political stability, uh, 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 continuation of uh, our liberal democratic uh, governance, Economic security, which is not a, a very uh, broadly interpreted notion. It, uh, I should say, it by no means, it should mean that uh, uh, we want an isolated economy or we want a non-interdependent economy. Uh, actually, it emphasizes on um, diversifying the partners, uh, trade partners, investment partners, so that Mongolian economy would be more interdependent with the global economy but excluding, uh, avoiding the situation in which Mongolian economy would be uh, overwhelmingly dependent on uh, one single country. 
the notion of human security as well. Uh, environment and ecology is one important aspect. And finally, the information security, including uh, freedom of information for citizens as well. Um, so let's probably better focus on the notion of traditional security and foreign policy. Uh, the, as stated in both in Constitution, the foreign policy concept as well as the national security concept, priority relations for Mongolia and equal uh, priority of foreign relations and equal treatment of the two neighbors is enshrined in all three documents. Where, I, uh, where have we come to this uh, idea, priority and equal, uh, some say equidistant relations with two neighbors? It's a lesson we learned the hard way from the Cold War existence. I mean, all, uh, uh, throughout the f four decades past World War II, Mongolia had to endure what we call the double Cold War. Uh, the Cold War between the, the communist bloc and the Western free world on the one hand, and also the Cold War within the larger communist uh, bloc uh, led by two arch-rival communist states, the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to enter the lengthy discussions on whether or not was it uh, rational or not to one-sidedly align with the Soviets, but uh, at the time of Mongolia's democratization, we realized this shouldn't be repeated uh, uh, without any uh, uh, objective reason. So Mongolia... Uh, as our framers of the constitution and security strategy, many of these distinguished statesmen are present here, especially on this front row, have decided back then in the early 1990s that uh, save for the most worst case scenario in which vital national interests of Mongolia are at stake, Mongolia should not enter a formal alliance with either one of the neighbors or even any other country. It basically means we will uphold the principles of neutrality and non-alignment. The word neutrality ensues one caveat. It means we still preserve the sovereign right to enter any necessary alliance should our vital national interests are at stake, uh, meaning should any country uh, uh, attempts an armed invasion or something short of that, we still preserve the right to enter an alliance with either one of the neighbors or any other country. Uh, but as I told you earlier, uh, we are currently uh, uh, indulging ourselves in a relatively benign time and space so that we can focus more on uh, not, not building an immediate military and political alliances, but, and further, uh, but further in transforming uh, uh, our national defense capabilities. And even with the priority relations of the two neighbors, uh, there's always a strong strategic mindset of Mongo among the Mongolians for centuries of always trying to overcome the tyranny of geography, the tyranny of distance, uh, of trying to create bridges, build bridges, uh, uh, create new contacts, partnerships with lands far beyond our immediate neighborhood. And of course, the wonderful opportunity came with the opening and democratization of Mongolia in the late 1990s and early uh, late 1980s and early 1990s, and that is very eloquently <laughs> styled and uh, w with the term the third neighbor policy. Um, and of course, everybody knows that uh, we only have two physical neighbors, and third neighbor is rather virtual notion rather than. Uh, realistic notion. The third neighbor policy, as uh, stipulated in our policy documents, is primarily advanced democracies. Uh, it's not a completely new concept. Uh, successive political regimes and uh, uh, monarchy, even the earlier socialist regime in Mongolia in 1920s have attempted to overcome this tyranny of distance. But of course, as, as I said, the opportunity came only with Mongolia's democratic transformation. It basically means no country, including our two immediate neighbors, can exert an absolute leverage. And I'm not uh, uh, ruling out the fact neighbors have leverage over their neighbors. Bigger, powerful neighbors have leverage over their smaller neighbors. I'm not naive about that. We're not naive. 
Uh, we're talking about no country shall have an absolute leverage, especially in the light of uh, growing economic interdependence between uh, countries and regions. Um, we can probably sum, and I should warn you that uh, uh, I, I'm just lumping, the, uh, categorizing uh, into the four pillars. I mean, it's not anything stated in the of official policy documents. It's just my own uh, imagination, just for the sake of making the ideas uh, more or less clear to you. Um, the, th the so called third neighbor policy of Mongolia, uh, we can assume, is based on four pillars, essentially. One is political. Another one is diplomatic, the third one is economic and social, uh, and, and the fourth one is security component. By political, I basically mean it's a commitment to democracy. Um, the only fact, uh, which was especially true in the early 1990s, but still remaining true now, Mongolia is in the spotlight of international communities because we are a democracy. Uh, and we can't ignore that. Uh, if we are uh, an authoritarian or semi-authoritarian or even a very benign authoritarian, benevolent authoritarian regime with such a small population and small-sized economy, I don't think Mongolia would have uh, uh, deserved uh, as much as international attention as we are doing now. So uh, political democracy is not only a luxury of political life, it's not only a conscientious choice of Mongolian people, but it's a national security necessity. It's vital to preserve Mongolia's national security. Um, secondly, uh, second pillar is uh, to engage in active bilateral and multilateral diplomacy, uh, being part of regional initiatives, uh, being authors and sponsors of regional initiatives, um, aspiring to become integral part of regional economic integration and uh, uh, and higher level summits and organizations as well. We can talk about a number of initiatives. Uh, the Nuclear Weapon Free Status Initiative. Uh, it's the, uh, probably the first and by far only example in which a single country, one country, declares itself a nuclear weapon free area. Um, uh, uh, our uh, modest contribution to regional confidence building, uh, such as uh, proposing to host uh, Japan-North Korea talks, uh, which is going to happen in Ulaanbaatar for the second time. First one was in 2007, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we're also aspiring to become, uh, uh, to assume memberships in international uh, Asia-Pacific organizations such as APEC, East Asia Summit, as we are already members of ASEM. And the third pillar is, of course, economic and social um, interaction, people-to-people, uh, -people, cultural, educational, um, in terms of investment. In all these spheres, we are uh, we're looking forward to, to create direct interest and the stakes of the third neighbors uh, to ensure people-to-people -people interaction are st uh, uh, stable and uh, continuing and to engage in a further educational cultural exchange. I believe this is pretty much what we're doing today and uh, that's why I want to especially thank the co-hosts of this wonderful event. This is actually not only bringing knowledge and update about Mongolia to the Australian and, and other international audience here, but it's very helpful to pursue our own very own national security. So that's why I was uh, beginning to say I'm utmostly grateful for, for this event. Um, the security component, it's uh, including but not limited to military and military in, to military engagement. Uh, I just want you to uh, think along with me uh, and try to reimagine Mongolia in the early 1990s. Here we have our former erstwhile benefactor Soviet Union gone. Um, their troops have withdrawn. Um, we are in the midst of a uh, dire economic crisis. The whole economy, which was hitherto subsidized by the Soviets, is collapsed. We had no prior experiment with free market system, let alone speaking about uh, any representative, representative democracy at all. 
And guess what? We have had about uh, uh, 90 or 100,000 strong military active duty for a population of 1.9 million then. Per capita, it was worse than today's North Korea. Uh, I mean, everything in Mongolia is per capita. Uh, whether you speak about uh, military deployments, you speak about uh, 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 shares in various sectors in economy, or even whether you speak about the number of Olympic medals, uh, everything is per capita. So per capita, it was already one of the largest militari militarized countries in the world, in the, in the region. With that economy, uh, we, of course, couldn't sustain that. Uh, and also, we didn't have any need. We uh, already normalized relations with China. We uh, created this new foreign policy doctrine, which is equal relations to and equal treatment of our two immediate neighbors. Um, so we had to find a way, basically, to downsize the military force, to make it um, uh, corresponding to the very needs of Mongolia uh, and capabilities, both fiscal and demographic capabilities of Mongolia at that time. So the framers of that uh, agenda, again, it's just my personal summarization. It's not really an official documentation. I've probably thought about four necessities in order to reform our defense and security sector. One is we should create compact, capable, and professionally oriented forces uh, by still maintaining national conscript service, but reorganizing to include a more professional and volunteer elements to it. So it's a two-in-one goal. The second goal it shouldn't have been a burden on national economy and should not supplant immediate priorities of nation, such as economic development, human development. Third, it should not only physically de defend Mongolia because we, we face no outright enemy uh, in pure military terms. Um, so it should support Mongolia's foreign policy initiatives and project the country's interest, credibility, and image on the international arena. So based on those three, um, uh, so to speak, uh, policy goals, uh, our defense transformation should have geared toward international peacekeeping operations and other multinational uh, operations. We broadly term it like uh, sometimes MOOTW, military operations other than war. Uh, some of we just call international missions for the short. Uh, uh, while still upgrading its homeland defense capabilities. So based on those uh, premises, uh, about a decade ago, since 2002, I'm not going to talk about how the laws are passed, uh, how many policy papers are written, but since 2002, about 10 years ago, Mongolia began its first overseas deployment of our uh, service members to traveled areas in the world. I'm just going to name you the countries our troops have been. Uh, it started with the Democratic Republic of Congo, former Zaire, uh, Western Sahara, Ethiopia and Eritrea, South Sudan, Sudan, it's Darfur, Georgia, Abkhazia, Chad and Central African Republic, Serbia slash Kosovo, Sierra Leone, uh, last but not the least, Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, as of the numbers, as of uh, June uh, of this year, 5,776, 5,776 service members, uh, including officers, non-commissioned officers, contract soldiers, even uh, including uh, female officers, have gone through one uh, or another or two or three of these missions. It's an accumulative number. It doesn't mean 5,776 people in total. It means a cumulative number. Some people have gone twice or thrice, but nevertheless, uh, it's about half of the entire active duty corps of the Mongolian armed forces. At any given period, between 120 and at minimum and seven to 800 at maximum can be deployed. We have a capability of de being deployed overseas. What are the forms of engagement? In a number of capacities, military observers, um, staff officers, uh, these are relatively uh, safe or relatively uh, coveted uh, duties. Also, we have sent uh, to various combat and near-combat missions, including convoy and protection 
at various levels, platoon level, company level, and full battalion levels as well. Uh, mobile training team, especially um, uh, artillery training teams, EMEDs, the medical uh, teams. Um, and of particular note is uh, our bilateral cooperation, uh, what uh, Mongolians and Australians have been doing at the artillery school in Kabul, training the Afghan National Army service members. Who are our lead partners? Um, first and foremost, we should of course note uh, the United Nations, because uh, most of these operations are mandated by the United Nations Security Council. Uh, of uh, individual countries, we have to name the United States, NATO, we have been part of two operations, ISAF, International Stability Assistance Force in Afghanistan, and formerly a K4 in Kosovo, um, and Australia. Uh, these are our lead partners. Among other partners, we can also name Poland, Germany, Belgium, France, and a number of countries. Uh, I'm not going to go to details what happened when, who did what, but let's, uh, let me share with you what was our rationale, frankly speaking. Uh, why we needed those deployments, and what are the outcomes. And I should probably lump rational outcomes into one, because what we envisioned, we are gaining pretty much. Um, again, I'm categorizing. We had political rationale and political result out of it, economic, both uh, nationally and for the defense sector. It was economically <laughs> beneficial. Uh, we should not forget the social benefit, uh, the fourth uh, pure military rationale as well. How important was it for uh, upgrading the skills of our, of our armed forces and individual service members? And last but not least, let's not forget the benefit for the individuals. Um, let me go to, 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 to political notion. By political, I mean both in terms of realist and idealist terms. Um, it promoted Mongolia's visibility in the international community. It extended the foreign policy by bringing about more partners from different parts of the world. Uh, we uh, upgraded, we increased our ability to achieve security assurances from not individual countries as much, but from the international community as a whole. Um, and uh, strategically, it was a litmus test, you know. Uh, especially our first deployment to Iraq and Afghanistan back in 2002 was a litmus test of how would our two immediate neighbors react. Are we crossing any line? Are we not crossing any line? Um, by far, uh, the reactions weren't as uh, harsh as we might, uh, as we were afraid of. So uh, there's possibility of a uh, room to maneuver in the international um, arena, international fora. It was a good litmus test for Mongolia that we indeed, is, we indeed are a sovereign nation. Uh, our two neighbors, of course, have leverage, but ultimately not as much as they wanted, they wish to have, or not as much as we are afraid they might have. Um, and then let's not forget about more idealistic notion of contributing for the common security, both globally and regionally. In other words, uh, becoming, becoming a country which is not only the recipient of security architecture, but also a provider, a contributor to global and regional security architecture. It's a, it's a national pride issue. It's, a, um, it's almost like a, like a mission, missionary. It's the zeal, it's the, it's the idealistic issue. In sum, politically, as our former defense minister, current foreign, foreign minister of Mongolia, the namesake of the ambassador told to an audience earlier this year, uh, our peacekeeping commitments means turning or using the hard power, which is military, into a soft power, projecting Mongolia's image. Let's turn to economic side. Why was it uh, beneficial and important economically? Um, okay, let me be candid and frank. No doubt uh, it contributes to national budget through the Armed Forces Development Fund, uh, the, the fund, the sum we receive from the United Nations through this participation. There's no reason to, uh, to shy away from that fact. There's no reason to be, uh, uh, to hide and to be, uh, uh, to be ignorant of this fact. Um, and realistically speaking, we, uh, because we entered the international spotlight, 
the amount of international um, aid and investment to Mongolia increased, not exclu exclusively because of this factor, but in part thanks to our own commitment to international security. And let's not forget the armed forces itself uh, being able to upgrade its weapons and equipment modernization and training facilities. Earlier, our speaker talk, talked about a place named Tavon uh, which literally means five hills. In Mongolia, there are two uh, distinctly different places with the same name, five hills. The one is the Koking coal deposit. The one, the one I'm going to talk to you is uh, the International Peacekeeping train, Training Center, not far from our capital city, Ulaanbaatar. And it's been upgraded um, uh, thanks to the Global Peace Operations Initiative uh, uh, funds provided by the U.S. government. Um, okay, uh, the social aspects. Uh, our commitments internationally aided the already positive attitude toward the military service all, always persistent in Mongolia society. Uh, Mongolia has a strong and proud uh, military tradition, and even during the communist regime, the armed forces, uh, I'm proud to say, never were an instrument of political oppression even during the communist regime. There was never a military junta, a military regime. There was never a military dictatorship. It was political dictatorship. So uh, throughout the existence of Mongolia, uh, for millennia, the, this military ethos was pretty much respected. And it, and it aids to already a uh, positive attitude toward the national service. And what about the military itself, its combat preparedness, its counterinsurgent skills, ultimately necessary for the defense of homeland should any um, threat of such kind occur to Mongolia? In a way, our soldiers and our officers and NCOs, they are learning by doing. They are engaging in near combat situations only to be able to repeat it should a necessity come to our country. Um, individually, last but not the least, how about professional skills, but also personal development, um, increasing benign human qualities such as integrity, uh, care for your body, patriotism, loyalty, family values as well included. And these are all very positive factors to our young uh, officers and soldiers who are, uh, who are basically seeing, I mean, we, we all talk about hardships Mongolia faces. We talk about domestic situation, we talk about political instability. It's not instability in the real sense of the world. We, we talk about uh, pollution, we talk about corruption, but when many of our young people go abroad and see the real basket case countries and regions, they are more proud of uh, uh, who we are, our nation, uh, as an island of stability in this world. Um, In a nutshell, this is basically what we have done. I should also mention for the sake of uh, time um, about a number of initiatives and, and exercises. We have a, a, uh, a signature event hosted by Mongolia, the Han Quest, the KQ, uh, is an um, Asia-Pacific-wide uh, Pacific -wide international peace operations initiative, which over the past seven years hosted more than 6,000 service members from 20 nations around the Asia Pacific, our wider region. Um, we also uh, host bilateral exercises with Russia, with China, India, Qatar, and Turkey, and uh, with the possible addition of other partners as well. Okay, uh, uh, to conclude, let me just throw you some, I mean, I can't avoid controversies. I can't avoid uh, looking at the, the other side of the things. Um, despite all the successes, we still have to be worried and cautious about a few things. Um, more strategically, what, what our active engagement in the international arena, uh, international uh, security means for Mongolia's foreign policy at all? Of course, it's a natural tilt toward the Western world, the third neighbor countries, the, the democracies. Uh, the armed forces are uh, being transformed along the lines of the NATO standards. We have in, uh, incorporated the JSTAF structure into our um, uh, our structure uh, of the command education. Um, so how will it fit the, uh, the more Western-oriented transformation? How will it fit with the continued Russian weapons domination 
I don't think in the near future we'll, we will get rid of the Russian weapon system. We'll continue to, continue to acquire, purchase, or otherwise receive Russian weapons and equipment. Will, will there be one day a conflict between the two? Uh, it's an open question. We uh, must be prepared to answer that. Um, we are only indulging in this uh, luxury because we are in a relatively benign neighborhood. But peacekeeping operations is not necessarily a pure warfighting war mission as any armed forces have to uh, be ready to. Uh, uh, how, how would it impact its warfighting uh, capability? Um, the third, we are so lucky that we receive a near universal public support for our international engagements. Uh, predominantly because of our for we are so fortunate of uh, suffering no single injury, let alone speaking of casualty, during the last 10 years of international active commitments. But for the worst case scenario, if a, uh, if a soldier has fallen, how would the public react? That's the, uh, that's the question we also must consider. Uh, isn't it way too, becoming way too imbalanced? Uh, uh, meaning, shall we uh, also consider uh, joining forces together with our two immediate neighbors in performing uh, international missions? Uh, this is a dilemma between our reform goals and strategic considerations. Fifth and the last. We all know that Mongolian troops are courageous and competent, and we are proud of that. But when it becomes ordinary thing, I mean, Ten years ago, deployment to Iraq, deployment to Afghanistan was out of the ordinary. It was the first international deployment since World War II. Uh, no matter the preparedness, psychological preparedness, social preparedness, and discipline were at the highest. When it becomes ordinary thing, when it becomes just uh, a normal for any Mongolian service member to do, will it impact the discipline and uh, uh, preparedness and cautiousness at all? In sum, we have gained so much and so much other potentials to pursue the bilateral cooperation in this field with this wonderful country. Uh, Australia as uh, both position themselves as an Asia-Pacific power and Asia-Pacific partner. Uh, during the recent visit of uh, the chairman of the uh, general staff, chief of the general staff of Mongolian Armed Forces, I believe the following aspects uh, could have been raised as uh, venues and rooms for possible cooperation. Um, we, could, uh, we have some rooms to upgrade, training, uh, or even mutual exchange of expertise. Secondly, I know that uh, Australian Defence Forces is very strong in humanitarian and disaster preparedness functions, regional assistance in MOTW, military operations and other than war. Uh, we have uh, plenty of uh, room to learn from, from your experience. Uh, we probably can continue our joint efforts, especially within the United Nations framework. Um, in, the, in the Han Quest military exercise, the Australian troops are highly welcomed. They are already active in the CPX uh, command and post, post exercise, but highly desired in field training exercise. Uh, and possible bilateral exchanges uh, and exercises as well. Okay, I'm almost coming to an end. We are determined as a nation to continue pursuing the objective of being a responsible member of the international community. The common cliche about Mongolia is that, and I'm happy to hear that all the time, uh, that our country, my country is punching above its uh, actual weight. Uh, in Australia, is more than welcomed into, to be a partner into this endeavor of ours, both because of our values as well as our very own strategic interests. Thank you very much.